this is a statistics course, but it's really a course in subordinating statistics to science. And the reason is because the audience I want to speak to got into science not because of data analysis, but because of some fascination with natural phenomena like this dinosaur or the seeds it's eating or the person who's feeding it for some reason. And our interests in these things very quickly turn into uh, data because that's how we systematically record the variation and the interactions and dependencies among these organisms. And to make sense of those numbers, we need mathematics. And then all of that mathematics that we've ignored since secondary school throughout college and our basic training in a science becomes relevant again and even necessary. We know this is true at very large scale phenomena like the climate and weather. Uh, there's massive amounts of data, but, uh, but it's also true at the small scale, the humble sciences, the social sciences, to make sense of people's relationships uh, and their needs and their conflicts. Uh, we also need lots of data, highly detailed data, um, at all scales, so we can make sense of how societies evolve. So you get all that data, and then what? Well. In introductory statistics courses, what you do is consult a flowchart to pick a procedure which gives you a p-value. The purpose of all the procedures that populate a chart like this are to test a null hypothesis, to reject a null hypothesis, hopefully. Uh, the research hypothesis itself, the target of your scientific investigation, is anonymous in these charts. And this has led to a lot of dissatisfaction when you move on to do more fundamental research in your field because the procedures in these introductory courses don't really address fundamental causation in any satisfying way and they're highly inflexible uh, compared to the uh, very large domain of hypotheses that scientists consider at the cutting edge of their fields. So what do you do instead? There are lots of options. Uh, but I've prepared 20 lectures that present the one that I like. This is the course that I had wished I had had in graduate school. Uh, in these 20 lectures, I try to rethink the role of statistics in research, whether that research is scientific or it takes place in industry, or it's just your hobby. Uh, and the idea is that we want to fully integrate statistical modeling with scientific modeling and scientific thinking so that they go together and they're woven together throughout the course of a study. The rethinking is not the Bayesian part. This is a Bayesian course and you will learn to do Bayes and we will do everything with Bayes. Um, but Bayes is no longer uh, some alternative way, some, some radical alternative to mainstream statistics. Bayes is mainstream. It's mainstream in every major science. Every major scientific publication features Bayes now. Everybody's heard of Bayes. Everybody has software in their computer to do Bayes. It's not unusual anymore. Bayes is mainstream. In this first lecture, I want to talk about the content of the course and the framing by talking about three different kinds of creatures. The first are golems. The second are owls. And the third are dogs, or excuse me, dags. I meant dags. Let's talk about golems first. Our tale of statistical modeling is going to start in 16th century Prague. So Prague in 16th century was the place to be in Europe. It was a very fancy center of an empire. Uh, Emperor Rudolf II, I think his name was, was a big fan of the arts and the sciences and tried to lure all sorts of intellectuals or performers to his city and was often successful. Like many uh, important cities in Europe at the time, there was a substantial Jewish minority and that Jewish minority was persecuted. And uh, as legend has it, Rabbi Löw, the rabbi in charge at the time, um, constructed using the Kabbalah, a defender of the Jewish people of Prague in the 16th century, a golem, which is a mythological clay robot that would defend uh, the people. Uh, this is this uh, legend has an unhappy ending, unfortunately, because the the 
point of the mythology is that toying with the power of creation is risky and the golem while um, quite powerful had no intellect or intent of its own and ultimately became too dangerous to maintain and was decommissioned as it were by the rabbi that created it. Prague today, if you have a chance to visit it, you should, uh, uses the golem legend uh, as a tourist uh, lure and there are golem statues and pastries and cookies all over the city. It's a very nice city. Uh, our interest in the golem legend uh, is that this is a metaphor for statistical modeling. The golem is powerful, much more powerful than its creators, and it can do things for them that they cannot do for themselves, but it has no intent of its own. And unless you're extremely careful with the instructions you give it, it can injure you or the people you care for. So let me review. Uh, golems, the things you want to know about golems, they're clay robots, mythological clay robots. They're extremely powerful. But they have no wisdom or foresight. They merely carry out their instructions, and so your instructions must be extremely precise. Uh, otherwise, you will encounter great danger and peril. The same is true of statistical modeling, unfortunately. Each of the little procedures in that flowchart I showed earlier is a little robot, a little clay robot. Uh, I use clay here playfully, uh, I mean silicon, right? Most statistical models these days are instantiated only in computers. We don't do them on pen and paper, with pen and paper anymore or with slide rules. Uh, and these little clay robots are very powerful. They can do, they're very good at stuff that people are not good at. And this is of course why we like mathematics and computers. Um, these logical procedures can can very quickly and accurately do things that people have a lot of trouble doing. So they're powerful, but they have no wisdom and foresight. Their purpose and their results is entirely up to our wisdom in choosing to apply them and interpret them correctly, and therefore they can be quite dangerous when misused. In the first chapter uh, of the book that goes along with these lectures, I, I discuss this example, uh, this chart figure 1.1 of little golems and the flaws with it. And I'm not totally against using um, heuristic charts of this sort. I just think we have to be very careful. I don't think they're very useful in advanced research. They're useful in particularly highly controlled and, in, and even industrialized contexts. These charts are, the procedures in these charts are incredibly limiting. They're good in, in only uh, very limited circumstances. And each of them focuses on rejecting a null hypothesis instead of a research hypothesis. And if you think that uh, falsification and the rejection hypotheses is a good philosophy of science, then I agree with you. But unfortunately, these procedures get it backwards. Uh, Karl Popper and the philosophy of falsificationism was not focused on falsifying null hypotheses, but on falsifying research hypotheses by understanding their implications and comparing those implications to data. And we'd like uh, a way of doing statistical work that helps us do that. Um, in these procedures and in these charts, the relationship between a scientific hypothesis and the test is really not clear because the research hypothesis is not represented in any transparent way, only the null. These procedures are not always bad. They're good in industrial frameworks or highly controlled experiments. So, what we want to do instead is be very careful about the relationships between our scientific hypotheses, the scientific process models that emerge from those hypotheses, and the statistical models we use to connect uh, those process models to evidence. So here's uh, figure 1.2 from chapter 1 of the book. I'm going to step through this figure one piece at a time so you can understand the point I make through an example from population genetics. And don't worry if you're not a population geneticist or you have no interest in population genetics, I'm sure you can think of some analogous situation in your own field because the, the situation I want to present here is actually quite commonplace. So let's start with one hypothesis and walk through the connections to process models and statistical models. So on the left here, we have a column for hypotheses and the the hypothesis I have shown is that evolution is neutral. And this has been uh, an ongoing debate uh, for a long time in the evolutionary sciences about the extent to which um, the sequence of, of 
uh, base pairs in DNA is to be explained largely by selection or by other evolutionary forces. Um, neutrality is a very hard position on that, that is basically just mutation is, is what explains most patterns of variation. I have a, a squiggly outline on this because hypotheses like this are quite vague. Uh, to do any work with them, you have to map them in the middle column to some kind of process model. And what I mean by that is a real scientific model that has logical causation in it. There are entities that you instantiate and you say which entities affect other entities and then what the consequences are of those things. And so one, I have one example on this slide and that is a process model of neutral, meaning there's no selection, uh, equilibrium, meaning that the population size stays the same. And this is a very particular kind of null model or neutral model that was used to try and understand evolutionary dynamics in the 20th century. And then from this process model, you can construct one or more statistical models. And I'm just, I just have one example here on the right, the circle M2. And the reason that process models and statistical models are not the same is that statistical models examine associations. They don't really have causal forces in them. Instead, what you have to do is study process models so that you know which implications to look for statistically will tell you about causal forces in the process model, help you estimate their strength and so on. But you need both. Uh, and, and statistical procedures, for example, might look at distributions. And in this case, that's the way this story unfolded in the 20th century. The neutral equilibrium model implies a particular distribution of the frequencies of different alleles in the population a power law distribution, if I remember correctly. But you can have other neutral models. So here's another process model that also maps on to the idea that evolution is neutral, the neutral non-equilibrium model. So you can have no selection, making it neutral, but the population size can still fluctuate. And almost all wild populations of animals and plants have fluctuating population sizes over time, sometimes radically so. And this gives you a different statistical expectation than uh, the neutral equilibrium model does. So in that sense, you could actually test these two against one another because they imply different statistical distributions. Now let's consider a different hypothesis altogether that selection matters. Now we all are prepared to accept that selection matters, but the question is to what extent does it matter for the frequency distribution of alleles in wild populations? Uh, everybody agrees that selection matters for design. Uh, and again, we, we find that there are multiple process models that are, that are attached to this hypothesis. The first would be uh, constant selection, and another would be fluctuating selection. The distinction here is that in constant selection, the, some trait is good, and it's always good. In fluctuating selection, uh, a trait may be good in one season or one year, and then not in the next. And um, biologists argue about the extent to which selection fluctuates, but everybody agrees that it fluctuates to some extent. Well, now here's the moral of the story. Uh, many fluctuating selection models generate statistical distributions that look like neutral models. And so uh, you can't easily tell them apart just by looking at the frequency distribution of alleles. And uh, again, this was, this was a, this saga that this slide represents is over. It happened in the 20th century, uh, but it's a general lesson that has reemerged in a number of fields, ecology, went through the same drama with the neutral niche model, the extent to which species are really different from one another. And again, uh, a model with niches and a model without niches can produce the same frequency distributions of species and so on. Uh, the point I want to get across is that in situations like this, at the cutting edge of research with complicated natural phenomena, there is no unique null hypothesis. Instead, we have to just be very careful about what process model we're talking about what its connections to hypotheses are, and which aspect of its statistical implications we're going to use to contrast it, to test it, and to contrast it with other process models. And that's not always easy. There are lots of things um, in my own work at my institute that have this, this inconvenient feature, but I've seen examples in all kinds of fields. So the ones I'm most familiar with, uh, phylogenetics, there is no such thing as a null phylogeny. Uh, what does it mean to randomly permute species on trees or traits? Uh, so much of the structure of evolution is already baked into the data we have. And so you have to have a non-null process model to make any sense about phylogenetics. Uh, 
Same goes for, uh, for ecological communities. Uh, there is no uniquely null ecological community. You can't, one does not simply permute um, a, a community of plants and animals. And uh, structurally, similarly, social networks in people and other animals. Um, again, there's no unique null uh, to randomize to. Instead, we need process models uh, and to study the implications of those process models. So I hope that I've at least for the moment persuaded you that we need more than little tiny null robots, tiny null golems. We also need precise process models. And then we need some set of statistical models, hopefully justified from those process models um, and from their implications so that we can get at some particular scientific question. What I'm going to call repeatedly in this course the estimand. What do we want to know? What are we trying to estimate in the first place? So that's golems. Golems are going to keep coming up in the course over and over again and I hope you don't get tired of them. Uh, the second creature that I want to talk about today is owls. And uh, owls have a, a outsized role to play in this course because we're going to draw a bunch of owls metaphorically. So there's this joke on the internet and I know some of you already know it that goes like this. Uh, the idea is you you have a how-to guide, a step-by-step -step guide on how to draw an owl. A very useful thing. Step one is to draw some circles. So we have here our first step one. There are two circles sketched out kind of a well one circle for the head and then uh, an ellipse for the body and then step two is draw the rest of the owl uh, and that's the joke. So the the point of the joke is that this is not very useful. Um, there's obviously a bunch of steps missing in the middle here. Uh, we need to draw some more circles and draw a branch and draw some features of the face and then do some shading and finally put in the detail. There are lots of steps to drawing an owl. Um, technological skills are often like this because the how-to guides leave out a huge number of steps and often the experts of those skills aren't aware of all the steps either which is why it's so nice to learn in close proximity to experts because they're not always the experts are not always consciously aware of their expertise and all the all the steps that go into it. So in this course I want to really draw the owl for you as much as possible and that means coding and it means forcing you to express statistical models and scientific models in code in detail so that the assumptions are not hidden and we can talk about the connections among the among their pieces. And so that means uh, slides like this we're going to we're going to take what would normally be uh, just a command in a stats program and we're going to program it by hand. In, and this is not a particularly complicated calculation. This is just the calculation of a Bayesian posterior distribution. But we break it down into five steps and walk through them. Uh, first step of setting up the calculation, calculating the prior, calculating the likelihood, and finally the, posterior, the normalized posterior distribution so that we draw the owl. We'll also have detailed expressions of statistical models. So if you're accustomed to expressing statistical models like regressions with a single formula, one line of code, that's not going to happen in this course. But it's for your own good. We're going to express everything that goes on in it. And uh, that will tell you how to draw the owl so that you know things. Why do I want you to draw the owl? Because I realize drawing, all the, drawing the owl every time can be a little annoying. There are three modes uh, of drawing the owl in this course. The first is to help you understand what you're doing so that you're not trusting in somebody else's canned procedure, the black box of the little golem. Uh, and I think if you're taking this course, you want to understand what you're doing. Second, there are selfish incentives beyond understanding. If you document your work, future you will thank you. I'll say that again. If you document your work, then future you will thank you. Uh, future we will thank you because errors will have been avoided when you carefully document your work. It's like reviewing your work during the documentation and this removes some kinds of error, not all kinds, but some kinds. And then secondly, you get to reuse your work in careful ways in the future as well when you document it. Point and click interfaces do none of these things. They leave no trail of breadcrumbs for you to review later. And let's face it, we all have complicated lives. We can't remember what we did exactly. But if you, if you document your work by drawing the Bayesian owl, as I say, uh, it'll all be there for you to return to. And then finally, 
We want a respectable scientific workflow. And what I mean is, it's not enough for you to trust your own work. You have to work in a way so that others can trust it. And that means having a documented, orderly, justifiable scientific workflow that involves setting up your scientific hypotheses, connecting them to, to scientific models, and then finally to statistical results. Okay, so the, the outline of the scientific workflow that I'm going to reuse in examples in this course through the next uh, 19 lectures after this one uh, have, I think, five steps. Let's count them out and see if I remember correctly. So the first is to have a clear idea of the theoretical estimate. That is, what are you trying to do in the first place? Uh, and we'll have a number of different kinds of examples. I, it may seem silly to have this as step one, but it's often quite hard to tell what a scientific study was trying to do in the first place. Um, all too often you have a vague metaphorical connection between research buzzwords and some data set and then some figures are drawn and that's not good enough. Uh, we have to do better. Second, um, you need some sort of scientific causal model uh, and that'll give a step two of drawing the owl. And uh, the theoretical estimate will be precisely defined in the context of scientific causal models. And again, these are these are models that can produce data. They're forward simulating models um, or logical models that generate uh, synthetic observations and let us design statistical procedures. So that's step three. We use the theoretical estimate and the precisely defined define scientific models to build statistical procedures that can get at the estimate or tell us that it's not possible to get at the estimate. Sometimes that's that's true as well, but that's good to know because that means we need to find a different way of investigating the phenomenon. Step four, we simulate uh, from step two the scientific models to validate that number three our statistical model works and this is a way of checking again this is to justify um, our our workflow so that our colleagues can believe that our software works this is also good for your own peace of mind to know that it works as well most of the models in this course are not so complicated that step four is strictly necessary but nevertheless i'll show you examples because i think it's something that i can teach you to do that you'll be glad you learned and then finally we analyze the real data uh, we pass through step four, so we feel like our, our statistical procedure works. It gives us, in theory, the theoretical estimate that we want, and now we're prepared to put the data in. Notice that we, we have not designed the scientific models or the statistical procedure conditioned on the data we use. Yeah, the, the data are entered at the last step. But when we get to that point of analyzing the real data, we may realize we forgot something, and that's okay. We can back up and we can do things again as long as we document how all those decisions are made. Okay, before we leave the owls, I want to say a little bit more about being a Bayesian owl and what all that is about. So uh, the reason we're going to do Bayesian owls in this course is because it's a very flexible approach. So what you see on the screen here is, believe it or not, Saturn, as Galileo Galilei would have seen it in 1610. You see the uh, scan of his personal notebook in the lower right here. The telescope that he was using, uh, one of the first, uh, was not very good and it made very blurry images. And so when you look at Saturn through a, a bad telescope or, or highly out of focus, the rings look like little ears on the side of it like this. And that's how Galileo drew it. Now the inference problem here is what's generating this blurry image? What does Saturn really look like? Now you know what Saturn really looks like because you've seen pictures of it since you were a child, but Galileo did not. Um, this is an interesting kind of inference problem because there's no sampling variation involved. No matter how many times Galileo looked through his telescope, he got the same blurry image. Nevertheless, there's uncertainty about what the generating image is, what the planet actually looks like. So the question I put to you is, is this a, statist is this a statistical problem or not? And you know I'm going to say it is. Of course it's a statistical problem. It's a Bayesian statistical problem. The Bayesian approach is permissive and flexible. Uh, no matter if you've got a data generating scientific hypothesis, you can analyze it with Bayes. It doesn't matter if the uncertainty is due to sampling variation or to some other 
process like light scattering in a bad telescope. Um, you can express uncertainty at all levels, whether it's measurement or observation or sampling biases, uh, missing data. All those different sources of uncertainty live together in the same analysis. Uh, near the end of the course, I'll show you how to use the Bayesian approach to get rather direct and immediate solutions to measurement error and missing data, expressing them in the kinds of regression models you'll be using throughout the earlier parts of the course. And as I said a little earlier, what Bayes lets you do is really focus on scientific models because you can go straight from the scientific models to statistical procedures with minimum fuss. You don't have to worry about which kind of estimate, I mean, sorry, you always worry about the estimate, which kind of statistical estimator you're going to use or um, uh, which kind of standard errors and, and all those other sorts of decisions. We have only one estimator in Bayes and it's the posterior distribution, which you'll learn about in the next lecture. Okay. <clears throat> The third critter I want to talk about before I finish this first introductory lecture is DAGs. So what are DAGs? So I just said a little bit about Bayes, and, and most of you know that uh, throughout much of the 20th century, especially the early 20th century, there was this uh, competition between the Bayesian approach to, st to statistical inference and the frequentist approach to statistical inference. Uh, these giants fighting it out uh, over uh, aircraft carriers and so on. Um, I'm not very interested in that fight and the reason is because both are very capable frameworks and the problem scientists really have is not which of those to choose but that they have no training in how to connect their causal models to their statistical procedures and so uh, that's what I want to talk about now. Now that said of course Bayes is better this is a Bayesian course but uh, you could teach this course in, using frequentist tools and it would be not so different in most places. Near the end it would be quite different, but in most places it wouldn't be so different. Uh, the important part is the part about the causal inference part, connecting our causal models to the statistical procedures. So how are we going to do that? Well, uh, the slogan that I often give is to put the science before the statistics, and no one's going to complain about that slogan. Uh, what do I mean? Um, for statistical models to produce scientific insights, you really need something outside the statistical model. And I've already mentioned this in the in the justifiable workflow when we when I talked about drawing the owl. What we need are scientific models, or sometimes called causal models. Models that contain in them um, um, entities that influence other entities and not the reverse. The reasons we do a statistical analysis a certain way are not in the data themselves. It's not enough to simply have a big data table and then look at it and uh, ask how many groups there are and so on and get to some meaningful statistical analysis. And the reason is because uh, data tables only have associations. And so we believe in causes because we believe in them. And that leads us to interpret associations in causal ways. And there's no way out of that. So you have to have the scientific model. And I'll, I'll have endless examples of this as the course progresses. Um, so the, the point of all this is that the causes of the data cannot be extracted from the data alone. Uh, there's a, a philosopher of, of science, Nancy Cartwright, who has this great slogan, no causes in, no causes out. And that'll be another motto for us in the course. So uh, other reason to think about uh, uh, causation explicitly here is our big looming problem is that even description and research design are all aspects of this. It, the models and the information you need to put into an analysis to successfully conduct causal inference is the same information you need to accurately describe a population or to design a study which gets at the desired estimate. These are all really the same sort of task. Um, and I want to I, I want to emphasize this issue about description here, and this uh, this may come up a few later in a few later lectures. But if not, I really want to emphasize it now because I'm an anthropologist, and a lot of what anthropologists do is describe things. Uh, it's a and and that's not a uh, some sort of low class occupation to try to describe things. Description is fundamental to scholarship. Uh, but to do description right, you need causal information. You need causal information about how the sample differs from the population. I'll say that again. 
to do description right, you need causal information. You need causal information about how the sample differs from the population. And when you're studying humans, at least, the sample always differs from the population, sometimes in very systematic and important ways. And you need to account for those things. The right way to adjust for those sampling biases is to understand what caused them. And uh, we'll have examples of these sorts of things in later lectures. OK, so what is causal inference? We're, we're approaching DAGs rapidly. We'll get to what a DAG is in a moment. So causal inference is uh, the attempt to understand the scientific causal model, to uh, understand the pieces of it using data that may have been produced by it. So everybody's heard that correlation uh, doesn't imply causation. Well, unfortunately, uh, causation doesn't even imply correlation, as we'll talk about later. But there's good news. It, it is possible to learn about causes from data. Um, but those uh, causal learning those causes requires more than just the association between variables. And there are two ways to think about what causal inference is, and this helps us think about how we would find it in data. Um, first way of thinking about it is that causal inference is prediction but it's a very special kind of prediction. And I'll say more about that on the next slide. And the second is that causal inference is a kind of imputation, which means uh, a, a counterfactual um, imagining of something that could have happened. And I'll say a little bit more about this uh, later as well. These are the same thing, actually. There's one kind of causal inference we do in statistics. But if you do it right, you can do both these things. OK, first, let's talk about causal prediction. So prediction and causal inference are really different tasks. But there's a, there's, it's nice to think about causal inference as a special kind of prediction. Uh, so th it's a kind of, of prediction where you predict the consequences of intervening in a system. Knowing a cause means being able to predict the consequences of an intervention. That is, you do something to change the system and you observe what happens. If you understand the causes operating in the system, you'll be able to predict the consequences of that intervention. So the key question is, what if I do this? And causal inference is getting at that question. Um, the trees are here as an example, a simple kind of kid's example to think through this. If you if you're inside your house and you look outside and you see the wind blowing the trees, um, it's, it's not immediately obvious from the observation alone which is causing which, right? You believe the wind blows the trees because you believe in the wind causes the trees to blow. Uh, but it's, it's the wind, the movement of the trees and the wind are always associated. So it's not clear which causes which. Now, if you were to do an intervention, like getting uh, you and a few hundred of your friends to climb up all the local trees and shake them, uh, it would not cause much wind. That's the prediction, at least, because you understand which is causing which. It's the wind that makes the trees blow. It's not the movement of the trees that generates the wind. The other way you can think about cause is through causal imputation, which are the counterfactual outcomes. Knowing a cause means being able to construct unobserved counterfactual things, things that did not happen, but if they had happened, uh, you would be able to predict what would happen as a consequence. So these are alternative histories, like imagine some other country like China had gotten to the moon before the United States. How would history have changed? If you understood the causes of history, you could say uh, what the effect of that um, uh, change would be. So that is, the, what if I had done something else or if things had turned out differently? This is the part of causal inference that we often think of as explanation. Uh, although explanation is a philosophically difficult term, so I'm going to try to avoid it for the most part. Okay, finally DAGs. This course has a lot of DAGs in it. DAGs are heuristic causal models. They're the simplest sort of causal models that you can work with, and they're really good for onboarding scientists into thinking uh, about scientific causal models that are distinct from statistical models that contain extra information, causal information. DAG stands for Directed Acyclic Graph, and you don't have to worry about what that means right now. We'll talk about it later. Um, but there's an example in the upper right. As I said, these are heuristic models. You can analyze them with your eyeballs, and that's what I'll teach you how to do. They help you clarify your scientific thinking, and you can actually uh, apply logical rules to them to design statistical procedures as well. And that's, that's what we'll start doing uh, in, in a couple weeks.
for now, just let me um, try to be a little bit provocative by talking about what you can represent in these and, and why they're needed. Uh, each letter represents a variable, something you can measure. Well, you don't always have to be able to measure it, but it's a thing that exists and, and is caused by or causes um, other measurable things. And the arrows represent causes. The arrows point in the direction of causation. So typically in a scientific study, we have some theoretical estimate, like we want to estimate the effect of x on y, represented by the arrow at the bottom here, uh, the x with the arrow pointing to y. But to do that, we unfortunately have to consider other kinds of relationships in the system. It's not enough, uh, everybody knows, just to focus on the two variables of interest. There are other kinds of things going on. Uh, first of all, there are other variables influencing the outcome, like b in, in this, uh, this particular DAG. And there are other variables influencing the cause of interest, like a pointing at x in, the, in this DAG. So here's a question for you, and I assume most people listening to this have had one or more statistics courses. Uh, which uh, of these, A or B, should you add in a model uh, when you try to learn the effect of X on Y? Are they the same? Are they different? Should you add them both? Should you add neither? Uh, we'll get to the answer later in the course, but if you're like me, you were never taught this it, at all to even think about it uh, in these terms. Uh, I'll give you a hint is they're really different from one another and you should do different things with them. Um, there are other variables like C, which are common causes of the two variables of interest. Here C is pointing into X and Y. Uh, C is a classical confound, and we'll talk a lot about confounds in the course. And obviously we need to deal with confounds um, because uh, X and Y can end up having a strong association, even if X doesn't influence Y at all. And then finally, the other variables can have relationships with one another which create complicated problems as well. And in this particular graph, the fact that A and B also influence C does create a complicated problem, which I'll talk about, again, as I said, in a couple of weeks when we focus on DAGs more. So the practical reason to learn this stuff, uh, these heuristic causal models, um, is that different statistical queries, different scientific queries require different statistical procedures. Uh, so even with one process model, one DAG, like the one in the upper right of this slide, if you had questions about X influ influencing Y, or rather about B influencing Y, you would need different statistical procedures to do that correctly, to estimate those things. Um, you can't necessarily do it in a single model. So questions like which control variable should you use are really not so innocent once you learn this framework. and uh, uh, just to caution you, and I'll demonstrate this later, it's absolutely not safe to just add every potential confound to the model. There are things called bad controls, controls that can actually make things worse. Uh, the other thing you want to do with these heuristic causal models is test them, and so we can talk about that as well. There are testable implications of any particular scientific process model. And of course, scientists have been testing such implications uh, for centuries. Um, now, DAGs are extremely useful, and uh, they're useful in research, and they're extremely useful in teaching. But eventually, of course, every scientific field aspires to move beyond purely heuristic causal models. If you've got more scientific information, you can represent your scientific models with that information, and you go beyond DAGs to other things. And at the very last lecture, uh, well, the second to last lecture, I think, of the course, I, I give some examples of this, of um, more elaborate uh, process models and how we can do stats with them. Okay, let me just try to summarize this, because this is the three critters uh, that we're going to see over and over again in the course. First, golems. This is my uh, metaphor for the brainless, powerful statistical models that we rely upon, and we need golems. We absolutely do. Uh, but you've got to design the right golem, and you have to deploy it in a very uh, a constrained set of circumstances so that it doesn't do damage. Uh, second are owls. We're going to draw the owls. And what I mean by this is documented objective procedures and working in a way um, that gives, our, gives us confidence in our work and also uh, justifies confidence of others in our work. And third, DAGs, directed acyclic graphs. Uh, a way to make transparent our scientific assumptions so that we can 
justify the scientific effort, um, expose it to critique, and directly connect scientific theories to the powerful golems we're going to use to extract associations from data. So this is a 10-week course the way I've planned it, although if you're watching the lectures online you can take as long or as short uh, as you like. Uh, I plan two lectures for each week and then this first week uh, at the top of the of the table here it's the focus is just learning the foundations of Bayesian inference and if you've got the book and you're following along in the reading you should read chapters one two and three um, to accompany the first two lectures. In the next lecture we will focus on really doing Bayesian inference. Um, so I'll see you there.